Kindly start, ma'am. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this fourth lecture in the monthly series on history and heritage, the afterlife of monuments. First of all, I would like to thank the Indian International Center for hosting this series and to the program office for running it so efficiently. So thank you both Tete and Sandeep Biswas for your help and your support. Um, we started this uh, lecture series in November last year, and we hope that we are able to continue it all of this year. So please, uh, our participants, please do look out for the lectures every month and um, uh, please do participate both in uh, logging in, listening on, but also in asking questions um, and putting them in the Q&A. Uh, so let me just also very briefly tell you about the next three or four lectures, just to, um, just to tell you how we have panned it out. So the next lecture will be on 16th of March, will be by Dr. Swapna Little, who's a heritage specialist. And she will speak on Shah Jahanabad, living in a Mughal city. Shah Jahanabad is in Delhi, as you know. Then on the, in April, on the 22nd of April, the lecture sort of shifts south. Uh, there is um, the art historian and educationist, Dr. Anila Varghese. She will talk on Hampi Vijayanagar, its life and afterlives. And again, in May, we sort of switch back from Karnataka to Punjab. And Dr. Vikas Rati of Central University of Punjab, he will speak on the fort at Bhatinda, from a desert outpost to an inner city landmark. This will be on 19th May, 2022. So we look forward to your participation as we develop the series, look forward to your comments, questions, um, and certainly from, uh, we look forward to uh, hearing uh, from you. Uh, the series, um, the, let me just sort of briefly in a, in a sort of in a sentence, tell you why we started the series. Uh, the series um, draws attention not only to the aesthetic appeal of monuments and architecture, but uh, also to the lived experience of people who have maintained and preserved these monuments. It also raises a whole lot of questions, and um, particularly questions related to classification of monuments in religious terms, such as can monuments be classified as Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, and so on. Um, and we um, certainly uh, question uh, that when we do this categorization, uh, what do we lose in the process? And what I think we lose in the process are the shared spaces that religions of India have traditionally inhabited and which they continue uh, to claim. So today you will hear from Professor, uh, Professor Yogesh Snehi. It is my privilege to welcome and introduce the chairperson for this evening's lecture, Professor Partho Datta. He's professor in theater and performance studies at the School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He is a music critic and reviewer and is an executive committee member of the Delhi Music Society. His interests are wide ranging, which and they include not just music history, classical traditions, in North Indian music and recorded music and archives, but also urban planning, architecture, and design. Uh, he was a fellow at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library from 2005 to 2008, and is also the author of Planning the City, Urbanization and Reform in Calcutta, 1800 to 1940. And he has jointly edited Urban Spaces in Modern India. With these words, I welcome all of you and over to you, Professor Parthodatta. Uh, thank you, Professor Ray. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Joge Snehi. Um, uh, very briefly, uh, let me just tell him about uh, his the academic work that he has done. He teaches in the School of Liberal Studies in America University in Delhi. He actually teaches history. Uh, he's been a fellow in the Institute of Advanced Studies in Shimla. He has, uh, uh, he has edited a, a volume called Modernity and Social Change uh, and Social Fabric of uh, Punjab and Haryana and very significant and a very significant author of a very significant monograph uh, called Specializing Popular Sufi Shrines in Punjab Dreams, 
memories and territoriality. I'll uh, 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 just very briefly uh, just hint at a couple of themes uh, which I've picked up from his book. And I, he'll be actually talking about it in much more detail in his own talk. Uh, so I have to say that uh, when I think of Punjab, I teach a bit of music history. I always think of Punjab as a cultural zone and not just the linguistic provinces of Punjab in, either in Pakistan or in uh, Indian Punjab today. So, uh, and particularly the music from the Sufi shrines. I mean, all the way from Kabul right up to Amritsar that includes West Punjab, Indian Punjab, Jammu, the hill states, Haryana, right up to Delhi actually. Uh, so this is a very large cultural zone, very, very interesting. And in the last couple of, in the last decade or so, this Punjab, the history of Punjab has been reimagined and reinterpreted by a range of wonderful scholarly work of which Professor Snehi is a part. Uh, people are working on all kinds of things. I just want to just mention a couple of names. Uh, there's the work of Anshu Malhotra. Uh, there is Nonika Datta, uh, social, uh, sociologists and social anthropologists like Radhika Chopra, uh, Paramjit Judge, and also the uh, music historian Radha Kapuria. So it's very exciting time to be, I think, a Punjab uh, historian at this time. Uh, couple of things uh, about the talk today, uh, which is called emerging from the partition, afterlives of popular Sufi shrines in Punjab, uh, what Professor uh, Snehi seems to be talking about, and he will be talking about it in some length, which is the paradox that uh, Sufi shrines in Indian Punjab seems to have not only survived And, uh, and I really look, look forward to this talk today and he'll be talking about it. The second thing that uh, he has uh, really, really uh, and very provocatively actually uh, throws a kind of challenge to all historians and social anthropologists is the way we think about history. The problem is that when we think about history with, with, uh, with the capital H, then it's about really the fidelity to written sources, uh, which really have no place for the popular. And uh, also, um, all modern Indian historians are in thrall of the colonial archive. And even this great colonial archive has very little place for, uh, for popular religiosity. Uh, so um, uh, I think uh, these are themes that uh, uh, Professor Snehi will be developing in his talk. And I now um, uh, invite Professor Snehi to make his presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Pato Datta, for a very kind and actually setting the tone for my some conversations today on the theme. Uh, I'm so glad uh, uh, that I could be part of the series and thank you for Professor uh, Ray for having invited me. And uh, what a pleasure it is to, to be hosted by the India International Center. Uh, now this talk uh, is, as Professor Datta said, is based on uh, my long engagement with uh, shrine spaces uh, uh, now for almost like um, one and a half decade. And in this exploration of shrine spaces, my argument revolves around locating, situating uh, shrines as, um, um, as a significant facet of uh, the formation of the religious process. And therefore the argument is to center shrines and center shrine practices and uh, its evolution of its spaces in underlining and highlighting any important significant religious process. Uh, in today's discussion, however, I will be picking up only one shrine from uh, close to Patiala. It's a, uh, a place called Karam. In Punjabi, we call it Karam, but in Hindi, we call it Guram. Um, uh, it's a place, an interesting place, interesting space, uh, because it is located on the frontier of a princely state, which was responsible for the massacre of a lot of uh, Muslim subjects in the nearby areas. Uh, which and forcing them to migrate to Pakistan. Um, now, what and therefore, on the one hand, you have this frontier location of uh, the frontier location of uh, 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 Punjab as a province, 
but also the frontier location of this particular shrine in the frontier of a princely state. So this dynamic of um, how do you understand um, shrine space in the larger uh, frontiers of uh, the historical discourse, the periphery of the historical discourse, and then to also situate a shrine which is located on the frontier of uh, a particular princely state uh, within the frontier debates of, remember, uh, the Indian nation state formation in 1947, creates an interesting possibility of looking at the changing contours of shrines and its spaces and its participation in the larger uh, uh, process of religious formation. Now, uh, let me just kind of read it out to what I have tried to compile so that I don't get distracted. Um, uh, now, the, the way it has been titled, as you would see, uh, I want to exemplify a shrine dedicated to this popular Sufi saint called Bikamsha, we call it Bikamsha in Punjabi, but uh, Bikamsha saint, uh, who is a Chishti Sabari saint uh, of a quite repute from the region. Uh, so it, I would try to kind of elaborate on what changes take place around this shine in the post partition complex. And therefore this notion of afterlife is also being underlined in the sub theme. Now owing, owing to its frontier location, the landscape of Punjab has undergone significant changes from medieval to contemporary times. From the framework of dominant historiography, Punjab's political contours have therefore remained in a constant state of flux. Uh, can you show me the slide, please? Next slide, uh, which is on the map. Um, uh, I hope it is moving. I'm just supposing it is moving. Um, from the frameworks of dominant historiography, um, Punjab, um, Punjab's political contours have remained in a constant state of flux. However, irrespective of these changes, evolved identities which were sub-regional and local that scholars have relegated as marginal. The, there are thus um, several imaginations of cultural zones as Professor Partho very rightly pointed out, uh, which can be called Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, Nath, Sufi, Nath, Nanak Panthi, Udasi, Ahmadi, Gulab Dasi, Sarvariya, etc. within the space which is identified as Punjab. This long duty manifestation of the sacred landscape faced a peculiarly complex scenario with the sudden and catastrophic partition of the province in 1947. Increasingly, the borders became non-porous and the territorial contours of the nation state became permanent. An important repercussion of this mammoth transformation was terrible loss of lives and forced migration leading to demographic reconfiguration and political reimagination of the region. And as you would see in the slide in front of you, this dynamic can be situated, uh, uh, you look but towards the left, you see this small town of Abohar in the map in front of you. Uh, looking at the nation state boundary, it would, be, it would look at one of the very frontier towns of the East Punjab, the Indian Punjab. But if you just remove the international border, actually it will come closest to uh, uh, places in Pakistan rather than places in the Indian side of the subcontinent, which means it will clo come closer to Pak Patan, the, the seat of Baba Farid, Sheikh Fariduddin Ganja Shaka, than it would be to Batinda, uh, the nearest large town in the Indian Punjab. So this reconfiguration of space, therefore, changes the way in which um, uh, Sufi Saint veneration uh, uh, has transformed in post-partition landscape. Sufi saint veneration has been an important aspect of Punjabi landscape since the medieval times. Farina Mir understands saint veneration as constituting a parallel alternative spiritual practice that was accessible to all Punjab's inhabitants in the period before the 20th century. Rather than limiting it to a symbolic adherence to Sufi values, she sees the practice of saint veneration as a shared piety constituting a sphere of relig religiosity and devotion that cuts across the boundaries that distinguished the Punjab's major religious traditions. The settlement of these Sufi saints and extension of their lineage led to the development of a practice of a saint veneration, which spread across both the rural and urban landscape of Punjab. In pla the places associated with these Sufis were identified with several names, Khanka, Darga, Mazar, and several other names. Eaton has identified this as a gradual process of Islamization 
that was facilitated through localization of various forms. Despite the problems of the term Islamization, Eaton signific significantly argues for the spread of Sufi shrines in Punjab, Bengal, and Deccan that facilitated the process of saint veneration. Uh, Anna, uh, Anna Suvarova remarks that traveling through India and Pakistan, one is struck by the abundance of saints' tombs, which are powerful places of pilgrimage and objects of popular devotion, nothing less than extraordinary sacred necropolis. Where someone's venerated tomb is located almost at every uh, each and every step of the way. While living saints continue to be continue to be significant, the graves of the buried saint developed as predominant centers of devotion and pilgrimage gradually. Many of the functions of living blessed men were transformed to the dead saint through various institutional, theological, and commemorative mechanisms associated with their hagiographical text and shrine spaces. Nile Green argues uh, that while the construction of mausoleum gave permanence to the saint, his memory was kept alive through the stories and rituals that surrounded it. The process of enshrinement ritualized as well as textualized the collective memory of the saint and gave an enduring stability to the landscape. Adarga resembled both a Sufi Khanka in various parts of the Islamic world, as well as a Dharamsala in South Asia. It was also known as a darbar, signifying a ruler's court. The darga is more than a tomb site because even after a saint dies, he remains open to petitioners. The moment of the saint's death is celebrated as Urs, the anniversary of his marriage to God. Green related this anthropocentric focus of spatial marking and memory to a wider Muslim settlement patterns which saw new territories claimed through either acts of burial or imaginary findings of burial. According to Marcia Iliade, sacred spaces fulfill three primary functions for believers. First, they act as places in which worshipers can communicate with the divine, whether through prayer, ritual, or contact with the images of gods. Um, second, sacred spaces seem to contain a permanent divine presence. Worshippers thus approach sacred spaces with the expectation of receiving blessings, healing, forgiveness, spiritual merit, or salvation. Finally, uh, in their layout and design, sacred places provide meaning to the faithful. They evoke passages from history, social structure, or religious percepts, and ultimately hint through forms, actions, and objects. The art and architecture, music and uh, uh, drama that embellish these places represent an ideal of that religion in its purest form. The central ritual act of a Sufi saint veneration is ziyarat, pilgrimage to saint tombs. Within the larger world of Chishti, Kadari, Soravardi, and Kalandri shrines in North and Northwestern India, network of pilgrimages collect connected saint shrines at Admir, Pakpatan, Lahore, Multan, Uch, Delhi, Panipat, Kuram, uh, Malerkotla, Batala, Kalir, etc. However, the partition of Punjab in 1947 into Eastern and Western Punjab led to the separation of pilgrims from their patron saint and shrines. The region saw an unprecedented migration across the Red Cliff Line, uh, exodus of non-Muslims from Western Punjab and Muslims from Eastern Punjab. A large number of refugees from Bahawalpur state and from Montgomery and Lahore districts entered India through the border along uh, uh, Amritsar and Ferozpur districts. Out of uh, these, about two fifths settled in rural areas and the rest in urban areas. Um, four fifths, sorry, uh, four fifths settled in rural areas and the rest in urban areas. This migration not only affected the demographic, economic, and political configurations but also led to a serious break in that social thread of Punjab, which had been woven through centuries of social and political exchanges. While colonial Punjab was characterized by multifaceted identities from different socio-religious groups, partition almost abruptly shook this milieu. However, the memories of shared cultural past continued to linger in the popular collective memory of Punjabis, even while majoritarian religious debates were gaining salience. Uh, 
In several cases, partition led to the migration of entire population of a village. And as you would see in the case of Karam, including the Muslim caretakers of the shrine. I don't mean to imply that all saint shrines had Muslim caretakers. There were a wide spectrum of shrines, which were always managed and owned by non-Muslim caretakers, which continued to persist without any break post partition. Most of these were memorial shrines, uh, both governed by Muslim caretakers or non-Muslim caretakers, were memorial shrines because the focus has been predominantly on major shrines and therefore um, not much focus has been there on memorial shrines. But the fact is that most saint shrines have been memorial shrines situated in rural and urban areas and variously called nigahas, marhi, dargahs, khankas, jatheras, mazars, etc. But these shrines were always on the margins of academic discourse. Reform movements of the late 19th and early 20th century also relegated these as fake, nakli, uh, 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 in terms of also say, saint practices, uh, they would be called a gapura, uh, which means liars, or fictitious, uh, they, these are kahaniya, uh, deviant, uh, or, or referred to as goragdhande. Uh, uh, or dere yeah, in, in terms of pejorative negative sense, vidkare, which are discriminatory, or pram, uh, pram indicating that uh, they were to be lesser than the established traditions. Post partition nationalist historiography has also presented the medieval conflict between Sikh guru and the Muslim state in religious terms, thereby limiting the possibility of any organic narrative of religious encounters in the pre partition past. However, contrary to the received tropes of post-partition Sikh or secular historiography, Sufi shrines offer a critical template to understand the in the making process of religious formation. Post-partition in 1947, East Indian Punjab, uh, East Punjab or Indian Punjab became predominantly non-Muslim, leading to the abandonment of large spectrum of Sufi shrines by Muslim caretakers. Interestingly, these shrines became alive within a decade after partition. Now, this I always try to place it in contradistinction with mosques, because mosque spaces uh, overwhelmingly were converted into households. Uh, and we, I have um, a lot of evidence to suggest, both from Wakf, Wakf Board or otherwise, too, also my own surveys, that a lot of Muslim spaces, uh, particularly mosques, were converted into household because there was a huge dearth of household uh, or houses uh, as the number of partition migrants coming from west to east Punjab yeah, was far larger in number uh, as compared to migrants going from the east to west. So, and therefore a lot of these mosques convert, but that is not the case with, interestingly, with uh, Sufi shrines. Interesting, these shrines became alive within a decade after partition as rituals and practices were reinstated and expanded. Urs, Kavali, Langar, Kushti Dangal or wrestling, etc., were crucial in this enterprise. Importantly, there was a continued recognition of these being Sufi shrines. So the attempt was not to say, uh, like in the case what has happened to remember uh, Sai Baba, huh, whose all Muslim antecedents have gone away. Here in this case, actually, they have been referred to as Sufi shrines, and these Muslim inheritances are important, therefore. However, during the period of the 1980s and 1990s, violent militant movement targeted several of these shrines. Several Muslim and non-Muslim caretakers were killed and some shrines were also bombed. Now, this is something which I came across during my surveys. You don't have any evidence otherwise, both in terms of historical works uh, or in discussions and deliberations, wherein violence during the Khalistani movement is talked about. And I came across a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, Sufi shrines were also important targets of militant violence. Uh, several non-Muslim caretakers were killed, uh, and Muslim and non-Muslim caretakers were killed, and some shrines were also bombed. Once the militancy weakened, newer set of shrines emerged in both the rural and urban landscapes. These shrines open a fascinating possibility to decode the continued existence of Sufi shrines in a non-Muslim landscape. Through a reading of saint shrines in village Karam near Patiala, I will narrate the landscape within which the saint shrine dedicated to Pikamsha uh, existed, uh, how it reconfigures post-partition and navigates the pressures of the dominant narrative. Can you show the next slide actually, which has another map where you can actually see in highlighted part where the village Karam is, it's highlighted in yellow. Now, 
Karam Sharif celebrates a lesser known legend about Bikram Shah, who died in the year 1709. So pretty recent, actually, in early 18th century. Uh, Chishti Sabri, saint of Patiala. Next slide, please. The legend states that when the 10th Guru, uh, Sikh Guru Gobind Singh was born in the east of India at Patna, the saint offered sajda prayers facing, uh, 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 facing that direction. When questioned about, about this by his murids, he told them that he had dreamt of a new sun rising with the advent of Bal Gobind or baby Gobind, uh, Bal Gobind Rai or baby, uh, uh, a child Gobind. Bikram Shah and his disciples then traveled all the way to Patna in Bihar to have a glimpse of the infant Gobind Rai, who will be the future Guru Gobind Singh, apparently then barely three months old. Desiring to know what his attitude would be towards two major religious traditions of India, the saint placed two small pots of sweets in front of the child, one representing Hindus and other Muslims. Can you show the slide actually? Uh, 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 the next slide actually would have just a moment. I don't know if this first slide is on. Yeah, uh, not this one. Uh, previous slide actually, the second, third slide, which was around slide in the beginning actually. Not this, yes, yes. Uh, Pikim Shah and his disciples and, okay, I covered this. Desiring to know what, uh, what his attitude would be towards the two major religious traditions in India, the saint placed two small pots of sweets in front of the child, one representing Hindus and the other Muslims. As the child covered both the pots simultaneously with his tiny hands, contented Pikram Shah claimed that the new seer would, be, uh, would treat both Hindus and Muslims alike and show re equal respect to them. After meeting Gobind, Guru Bal Gobind at Patna in 1666, the peer lamented that due to his old age, he would not be in a position to travel again and wished to meet Bal Gobind at Karam. Later in 1702, can you go to the next slide, please? Guru Gobind apparently uh, uh, Guru Gobind apparently visited the Peer and the place they met is commemorated by Gurdwara Milapsar, known as Bauli Sahib, due to the location of a medieval step well in its premises, which was apparently revealed to Sant Baba Gurbachan Singh Kamliwale in the year six, 1965. The Gurdwara is managed by a local managing committee headed by Sant Baba Avtar Singh uh, uh, the shrine organizes celebrations every night of Amavas, the new moon. A huge fair, which is locally called Jod Mela, is organized on the day of Besakhi, and a Nagar Kirtan procession from Gurdwara, from the Gurdwara, uh, visits and play, pays tribute at the Darga of Pir Pikram Shah. These new shrines and rituals create an important link with the past through rework myths, rituals, and histories, and represented and performed in ways that makes sense to the leaders and followers today. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, next, 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 next. Okay, we can stop here actually. Um, the shrine of Vikram Shah witnessed plunder and loot amidst violence of partition of the province. Much is known of the alleged role of the princely state of Patiala in the ethnic cleansing of the Muslims in this part of Punjab. It remained desolate for several years until the 1950s, Baba Mast Varesha, along with Baba Mast Divani Bullesha, undertook the charge of restoring. The slide above we actually about that uh, previous slide. Am I, after the demise of the former, the latter had, has been playing a central role in the expansion along with his wife, Bibi Mast Divani Polusha. Both are the present Gaddi Nishins uh, of the shrine. Baba Mast Divani Bullesha, uh, uh, he is right in front, is Kumhar or Potter by caste and was born in a nearby village, Manderi. Under the leadership, under his leadership, the Dargah has constructed a large langar hall. A sarai 
for peasants, uh, sorry, for peasants who are predominantly also pilgrims. Baba Bulesha identifies his lineage with Pikchistis, a new Chishti sublineage that emerged after Pikam Shah. Pikam was born in 1625 in, village, uh, in a village in Pihova, today in Haryana, to Sayyid Yusuf, who died while the child was barely 10 years old. Pikam Shah's mother, Malka, brought him to her maternal home at Sargoda near Ambala. His maternal uncle, Mama Pir Fazal Shah, uh, sent him to uh, Amreta for spiritual learning. He became the foremost disciple and Khalifa of Chishti Sabri Saint, uh, Hazrat Shah Abdul Mali of Amrita, and was sent to Quran for propagation of the Sabri order. Bikram Shah's blessing transformed the life of a poor Brahmin Dola, who assumed the name Roshan Dola right now, yes, rose to become in charge wazir of the royal treasury under Shah Jahan. Subsequently, the emperor bestowed the land revenue of 26 villages to the shrine. A significant mausoleum was constructed of the grave of Bikram Shah uh, and Roshan Dola, was also buried in an adjacent complex. There is a large mound in the center of the village. It must have been a fort of significance and is of archaeological importance. There are actually next slides uh, which focus on that particular mound. Local legends relate the village to Kaushalya, mother of legendary King Rama of Ramayana, who it was said married Dashrata here. A temple and Gurdwara in an enclosed baradari dedicated to her is located atop of the mount. It was apparently built by Maharaja Karam Singh, the erstwhile princely of the erstwhile princely state of Patiala. Before the partition of the subcontinent, Karam was a prince, a primarily a cluster of settlements dominated by prosperous Kambo Muslims. Now, Kambo is a caste which uh, or you would find adherents of this particular, uh, uh, or within this caste, you'll find adherents uh, to Islam, to Hinduism, as well as to uh, uh, Sikhism. So you'll find Kambo Hindus, Kambo Muslims, and Kambo uh, Sikhs also. But in this case, we're talking about Kambo Muslims. Other Muslim communities of the village comprised of Mistri, Mughals, Khojas, Lohars, Penjas, Tillis, and Dhubis. They, they were, uh, there were bastis where lower caste non-Muslims like Kumhars, Majabi, Chamars, and now known as Ravidasias, or earlier known as Churas, who are known, now known as Balmikis, and sugar caste lit. There was not even a single upper caste Sikh household in the village. Besides Pikam Shah's shrine, the village also had a Shivala. Today, the Jat and Rajput Sikhs who migrated from Gujarat, Sialkot, and Lailpur districts of West Punjab post partition constitute the dominant castes of Karam. Niranjal Balmiki, the prime narrator of this case study, has had a long association with the shrine from pre partition era. His family is a native of Karam and lived on the outer fringe of the village, which was primarily a cluster of Muslim dominated villages before partition. The shrine today has two major entrances. Uh, can you move on to the next slide? A huge, next slides, yes. Please continue for two, three slides. A huge, yes, now here. A huge medieval gateway leads to, late medieval gateway leads to the first story of the mausoleum of Bikram Shah, while the second gateway leads to the actual place of burial. Uh, you can move the next slide. Adjacent to the shrine is a mausoleum of Roshan Dola and probably other members of his family. Currently, Langar is distributed to pilgrims from the old Langar Hall. You can please continue the shrines, uh, slides, please. Yes, uh, this is actually the, uh, the top story of the shrine. Next slide. Uh, when I visited the place in 2015, this is the entrance to the, the main part of the, uh, the grave of actually Pikam Shah. A new large hall and a sarai on the first floor were being constructed adjacent to the outer wall of the shrine. The shrine has two mosques, One inside the complex, uh, please pause the slide here. One inside uh, the complex adjacent to the Darga of Pikram Shah and another along the major gateway of the shrine. A large hall was later added to the structure by the current Gadinishin annual celebration during Urs. As you can see, actually, the death anniversary right now, you have a poster in front, uh, Salana Jur Mela, uh, which is the death anniversary of the Su Sufi saint. Go on for two weeks 
and include a recitation of Ramayana and Guru Granth Sahib. It is interesting, actually. Uh, next slide, please. Um, offering chadar at nearby shrines, uh, ceremony of Gyarvi Sharif and Gusal Sharif. Gusal Sharif. Gyarvi Sharif is celebrated every month on the 11th day of the new, uh, moon. In contemporary Punjab, this shrine occupies a central place for pilgrimage and spiritual need of Sabri disciples who are from a variety of caste affiliations. Contemporary Sufi shrines and urs claiming association with this order can be found in Amritsar, Batala, and Phabara. Around 1996, a bead of Guru Granth Sahib was installed in one of the room, next slide please, one of the room along the enclosing wall, this one, yes. Granthi and his supporting Sikh staff takes care of the premises that have several images of Guru Gobind Singh's life. In another adjacent room, a Hindu uh, Granth uh, uh, Ramayana is located, I put Hindu actually in inverted commas, is located in which is attended by a Pujari. The room has idols of several Hindu deities. This has been a more recent addition and was in, uh, was in place both um, during my first survey in 2010 um, and second survey in 2015. Both these rooms are not classified by pilgrims as well as the staff as a gurdwara or a temple, but cater to the religious needs of diverse spectrum of pilgrims who visit the shrine. Recently, the Darga management faced an objection from the SCPC, the Shromani Gurdwara Prabhupada Committee, which controls most gurdwaras of Punjab, historical gurdwaras of Punjab, over the location of bead of Guru Granth Sahib in its premises. The criticism is apparently being addressed by assigning a different and independent gate or door to the room where the Granth is located. It is intriguing to note the patterns of encounters between popular sacred shrines, communities, and the dominant discourses and institutions. There was a break in succession at Guru Karam Sharif for at least a decade post partition. Um, the contemporary caretakers, who are low caste Kumhars, uh, reconfigured the shrine immediately after partition, within half a decade after partition and try to uh, situate. And the shrine in the process had got situated in a newer milieu post-partition where the village has completely got transformed, at least demographically. In shrines like Karan Sharif and Simki figures in, um, um, were also, remember, recipients of important Mughal patronage. But it does not necessarily distance these shrines from um, the narrative of the Sikh tradition. Now that actually is an interesting uh, uh, both what you call important popular narrative also, which connects the shrine. Uh, now, as I say, um, I use this idea of the frontier. So on the one hand, the, um, you have the shrine in the frontier of a, a princely state, uh, but although at, at, the, at the same time, remember, within the larger historiography, uh, we don't see much conversation and interaction between uh, 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 Sufi saint shrines and Sikh tradition, as much as we see an encounter, both mostly violent, between the Mughal state and the Sikh gurus. But this does not necessarily distance Pikam Shah from Sikh gurus. Shrine narratives, conversely, take a narrative trajectory of encounter, even in times of conflict. Partition wiped off entire Muslim population from Karam. The Shudras, Kumhars, um, uh, um, um, in this case, Kumhars and Dalit castes like um, uh, Valmikis and uh, Ravidasias are the only extant link between pre and post partition Karam. So the important link actually of, of, are of lower castes. The presence of lower castes in the marginal and spiritual contours of several Sufi shrines speaks of the legitimizing process that was enabled through these abandoned spaces. This process should be situated along uh, historical marginality of lower caste from shrine management in Punjab and talking about predominantly Sikh shrines and Hindu shrines, where the dominance of the upper caste is very apparent. Dalits constitute more than one third of the total po overall population of the post-partition Punjab, the largest in India, as you all may know. Inclusive of Chamars, who are now known as Ravidasyas, Churas, who call, uh, who name, prefer name to name themselves as Balmikis, Majabis and Masis, uh, which are the Christian Dalits. These castes have found a significant expression in Sufi saint shrines. Desolate shrines gave these castes an opportunity to legitimize um, their place within the space offered by a post partition milieu. It is therefore important to pay attention to the process through which a Sufi shrine situated itself in a demographically transformed Karam 
from Kambo Muslim to Jat and Rajput Six. Partition provides this intriguing insight into the historical encounters of communities with new demographic realities. As stated earlier, Shine's narrative, um, uh, uh, as stated earlier, Shine's narrative past also provides a script on which the present encounter gets uh, uh, situated. Tussle with the SGPC over Gurgan Saib in Saikram also reflects the broader patterns of social relations negotiated within the spatial lens of village and shrine narrative. Karam is a rural shrine and visited predominantly by peasants. There is a larger network of big Shabri shrines in Dwaba, Maja, and Malwa. Similarly, the mythic association of the archaeological mound of the village with epic narrative of Ramayana also manifests in temple inside Karam. There has, however, never been an opposition of the, uh, to the location of temple inside the shrine space. Debates on religious reform in colonial and contemporary India have not paid attention to the ways in which shrine spaces encounter the pressures of reform. Arguments have remained uh, confined to the ways in which major shrines, um, uh, and you can see that in front of you, I also a poster, shrine actually tries to posit itself as uh, a space which is inclusive. Huh? So here actually is a poster of an ekta mila, huh? uh, um, um, a fair for uh, unity. Arguments have remained confined to the ways in which major shrines, communities, religious and religious boundaries were being formed and imagined response to Christian missionaries and other reformist ideologies. Religious discourses were therefore reduced to dominant frameworks of identities, Sikh, Muslim or Hindu. I try to complicate religious debates by paying attention, closer attention to complex ways of reception that shaped modes of religious, religiosity in the, uh, in the 20th century Punjab. Textuality in this imagination remains one of the several components that define the territorial, territorialization of shrines, encounter being another. Thus, in addition to articulation of Hindu, which means, in I would rather prefer to use Sanatini or R S Samaji, Sikh, I would prefer once again Sanati, Tatkhalsa, or Namdhari, or several other nomenclatures, or Muslim, me preferring Anjuman, Ahmadi, or otherwise. Sensibilities, closer attention should be paid to even more complex ways uh, inter uh, of their and their intertwining with Udasi, Sufi, Nath, Jat. Kambo, Khatri, Kumhar, Balmiki expressions, modes of social expressions, which are important ingredients of any religious articulation in a given social milieu. Um, uh, I would stop here and would rather want to have more questions. I would want to immediately show some of the rest of the, rest of the slides. Um, uh, just a moment. Okay, uh, this is actually one of the rally being organized, the previous slide, within the village, an eight day camp uh, organized for, um, uh, for, for time turban. You see there uh, within the Sikh reform uh, debates, reformist debates today, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, 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 time turban, uh, apparently because the Sikhs are no longer, uh, at least the younger generation is no longer so attuned to time turban. So you would see in within the space of the village, uh, all, all kinds of contesting spaces, but yet you see the placement of this particular space governed by a particular kind of uh, religious and social sensibility. Um, I think I should stop here now. Thank you very much. Okay, um, uh, thank you, Professor Snehi, for that wonderful and fascinating talk, and particularly your focus on one particular shrine. Um, and uh, I'm sure there'll be a range of questions uh, addressed to lots of the, lots of issues that you've raised. So uh, uh, I can see um, maybe we should just wait a couple of minutes. I don't see any questions in the uh, in the chat box yet. Um, so um, le let me just uh, just ask you just to begin with uh, uh, a couple of things. So one of the points that has really emerged from your uh, from your uh, from your talk is that 
how uh, and this is absolutely fascinating uh, which is that uh, how these uh, the 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 popular shrines uh, in punjab have actually become in some senses uh, uh, legitimizing spaces for the lower castes right uh, what uh, does it tell us is are you really trying to suggest that this is another way of doing dalit histories i have actually always resisted uh, thank you for uh, asking that question professor datta i have resisted this classification uh, it's just that in the case of this particular shrine you see an expression which might appear to be dalit expression but this is just one of the ways in which you can try to interpret uh, a set of shrines uh, where and actually the dalit leadership has come forward to uh, and therefore this trend of they being representative of the larger dalit articulation can be seen but then you have all other kinds of shrines one another set of shrine which is known not known as darga actually set of shrine which are known as peer khanas now peer khanas uh, are a very peculiar kind of shrines and they are predominantly located in the south part of punjab and peer khanas are particularly associated with the agarwal samaj these okay. are actually private samaj uh, shrines and dedicated to baba lakhdatta as well as uh, uh, sheikh haider so they are therefore specifically um, you see uh, urban baniya shrines so as i'm saying that one of it could be one of the ways in which you can see the articulation of a dalit religiosity can be expressed but there are multiple ways in which this operates so i would not like to uh, any kind of express the one singular uh, uh, articulation of the process yeah i uh, want to ask you a slightly more provocative question which is okay. that uh you know um what does it tell us about historians and their theories of history how do you integrate this kind of knowledge into what we call history with a big edge uh the reason i ask you this question is that uh, uh is that you know there is a way we look, since this is a series dedicated to the afterlives of monuments uh now we have a, a well established theory and how we place monuments from the past into our theories of history right but what you have been studying is has not been integrated these kind of spaces do not get the status of monuments no, so not. how do you plan to integrate it that's what i mean. what does it tell us about history in a larger sense see my way of integrating them uh, within the larger process uh, one of the ways can be to do it uh, apparently would be to look at uh, shrine structures in form of architecture actually that is one of the way that you can try to do it mm -hmm. so if you want to do that then obviously shrine spaces do speak of a process a uh, very interestingly irrespective of the fact that you talk about a peer khana which is as i said agarwal samaj peer khana or a jat shrine which may be known as a nigaha hmm? mm -hmm. uh, or as i'm saying the more contemporary shrines uh, known as dargahs or otherwise you do find certain set of common expressions of those spaces in terms of architectural frames and frameworks and so there is one way of doing that uh, looking at architecture but these are more uh, uh, what you call built uh, uh, arguments which come through built spaces yeah. but what lies in inside the built spaces once again is yet another way of doing it grave stones or grave shrines uh, they are one of the another fundamental way in which you can try to place it because as you would see even in memorial shrines grave the presence of grave is still important even the shrine is is an agarwal samaj shrine irrespective of the grave is important right. now the imagination and construction of the grave however is very interesting so what do you do because these graves are mostly dedicated to either baba lakhdatta whose major shrine now in india is in una or in near langiana in uh, near moga Uh, the major shrine was in uh, dera uh, 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 in the frontier of pakistan along afghanistan so what they do they carry handful of sand and okay. bury it in the place that they want to construct a memorial grave similarly when they go to maler kotla which is once again a shrine of a uh, suravardi sufi sheikh haider they carry handful of soil and bury it there so presence of grave once again is a very common process so recognition of that muslimness i believe is one of important significance be it irrespective of the fact that shrine is a a khatri shrine or a jat shrine or a nagarwal shrine or a dalit shrine so in terms of built structures i can see there are ways in which you can place them in the larger process but once you look into the dimension of religious affiliation and religious association then obviously the entire picture changes 
it doesn't fit into any received theory of uh, the religious process. And therefore, I try to particularly be very careful to, I know that um, there is scholarship which can very easily suggest and go into to make into a spaces of Dalit liberation. Yeah. I know it yeah, because there have been films made on this, a very good, fascinating films. I'm telling you some of my friends also. There is work which has emerged around Jatira Shrine, which kind of look into particularly the Dalit angle to it. But I would not want to look at it because shrine spaces have a very multitudinal kind of possibilities because they are not textual tradition. They are traditions in practice. Yeah. yeah. And because of which they are dynamic. They are they have that edge to change, to refashion. And therefore, they, uh, they are difficult to grasp and difficult to, uh, uh, what you call, put it in a, a singular narrative. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, before I ask Professor Ray to, uh, uh, I'm sure she will have some questions. Yes. Yes. Um, I just uh, wanted to just ask one very small thing. What are the music traditions uh, uh, attached to these shrines? Are there anything? I mean, I'm talking of not only by music, I just don't mean singing. Are there mm -hmm. drumming traditions, for instance, or recitations? Um, well, I have not paid very serious attention to the musical traditions, but uh, one of the important component of rejuvenating any shrine has been to institute the Kavali practice. So oh, Kavali gets, yes, yes. So you see within the shrine narratives, this is being particularly emphasized. Uh, when was Kavali instituted? Eh? So you would certainly mark uh, the beginning of Kavali as an important therefore uh, marker of reinstating. The other important thing was Langar actually. So along okay. with music actually establishment of Langar becomes. So in terms of ritual practices, these are two most important rituals which will always be cited. Music on the one hand and kitchen on the other. But then there are, there are wide varieties of other musical traditions also. Uh, you see the presence of Bardic traditions. Um, uh, Tadis also come to popular saint shrines during festivals, speaking of glory of a particular saint or otherwise. And interestingly, I was in this conversation with some friends in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, some of these traditions have completely got off the record in Pakistan. Uh, like you don't hear of Tadis, uh, the, uh, the bards, as much popular in Pakistan Punjab today, as much you see them popular in the Indian Punjab. Perhaps one of the reasons for that is the patronage given by the Gurdwaras, where Tadis become sick in the process. But you still see their presence in the, the shrine spaces. I have at least been witness to two such occasions where Tadis was performing for particularly Sufi saint shrines. So I would say Tadis uh, and their performances, folk performances and um, along with their musical instruments, remember uh, a drum, small drum, uh, um, and then sarangi, uh, you know, of uh, so some of these uh, uh, tad as it's known, uh, small drum. Right. So these are predominantly played along with the usual Kavali uh, ensemble, ensemble uh, yeah. harmonium and this and that, right? I have to say that you must know the work of Peter Panke, who has done on uh, on West Punjab, who has studied the, uh, the the shrines of of Pakistani Punjab and the music traditions there. It's a wonderful photographic book. But anyway, I will not ask any more questions. Uh, Professor Ray, you wanted yeah. to ask something. Uh, there are yeah. a couple of questions on the chat box, so then I then I read them out. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. uh, uh, no, fascinating talk, absolutely. And, um, you know, um, let me let me also uh, come in on uh, Professor Datta's question about historians and how they study uh, shrines and, you know, focus it in terms of Hindu Muslim um, uh, colonial architecture. And I think the important point, and I would really agree with Professor Snehi, is to shift from architecture and monuments to spaces. Yes. We don't study spaces. You know, we study monuments and architecture. And I think that's a complete disaster that we've done. Um, so if we study spaces, and you know, this is where I think Professor Snehi's talk is extremely important. Um, I would, Professor Snehi, go take you back. You know, I mean, I hate uh, modern historians starting, or medieval historians, I'm sorry, I'm an ancient historian, <laughs> I have to bring that in. So I hate medieval and modern historians starting as if the world started in the 18th century. It did not. So if we go back to Punjab, you know, you're talking about saints and you're talking about saint venerations, veneration of um, uh, graves. You know, it goes back to the Buddhist tradition. Okay. Now, uh, what 
um, what has happened, you know, Guram has a, you talked about the Ramayan tradition at, um, at Guram, but Guram also has, uh, goes back, it has Mitra coins. It's a much more ancient site. Right. It has not been excavated. I'm pretty sure it's a Buddhist site. You know, you've seen Sanghol, Uchapind, you know, near, uh, uh, near Chandigarh. Now, what, um, what, um, and I would really um, request you to, to comment on this as, as a historian, um, what this historiography tradition has done is that Buddhism in Punjab doesn't exist at all. You know, no historian talks about it. And there is no, um, there's no sort of connectivity between these sites. I'm not saying that um, we, take, uh, we take what you're talking about in terms of the Sufi shrines back to the ancient period. What I'm saying is that the spaces mm -hmm. have been configured over time in a variety of ways. Right. Uh, right. So in, this, in, in the period that you're talking about, um, certainly, I mean, nobody can talk about e every period. I, I completely agree. But um, within, uh, within the politics of the state, a certain aspect of history gets marginalized and, um, you know, silenced. Um, and this is what I see in Punjab happening uh, with uh, the Buddhist sites and the fact that uh, there was a very thriving dynamic Buddhist tradition which talk, which, is in, which is involved in saint veneration, all of that. So my, um, now my question to, uh, to you is that as a historian uh, with a focus on sacred spaces, I'm not talking architecture and monuments, how do we, how do we bring this in so that not just the dynamism comes in, but the continuity as well of the spaces, not of the, you know, not of the religions, not of those classifications and tags that we assign. So I think I'll stop there, but I really found this so interesting and so fascinating. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, I, if I can just quickly respond, Professor Datta. Yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you see, the limitation of this particular uh, talk was, uh, that I was focusing on one shrine and uh, the narrative possibility of bringing in other dimensions was little there. But I do come across a more vibrant kind of shrine narratives where shrines association with particularly Nathpant tradition has been very quite uh, manifested. Uh, I can give you examples of some of the contemporary shrines uh, which were built in the last 15, 20 years, uh, some even less than that wherein the dream narrative actually, uh, uh, one of the important component of the dream narrative is to uh, express its linkages with the Nath tradition. So Nath becomes a Sufi therefore in the process. Hmm? So, so um, both in terms of particularly therefore spaces, uh, if you look at the contemporary shrine in, in Indian Punjab, most new shrines which have come up, and that is uh, once again expressed through the case study that I've done, therein the presence of a Nath symbolage has been very predominant, uh, be it in the form of a tuna or a sacred hearth fireplace, wherein you would see the presence of Trishul with Panchatan Pak, uh, the Shia symbol of the five, and they both will be placed together. Mm. So the presence of mm. tuna, the presence of mm. hearth, therefore becomes an interesting manifestation of how the Sufi mm. and Nath tradition intersect. This also is established, mm. by the way, by textual uh, uh, evidence, because we do know of uh, 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 Sufi saints having practicing uh, Hatha Yoga. We know of Baba mm. Farid practicing Hatha Yoga. He is popularly represented as performing uh, Chillai Mahus, uh, hanging himself upside down from the top of a, um, on the top of the well from a tree, or uh, um, uh, or we know of the conversations, particularly around textual um, uh, dialogue hmm, on once again Hatha Yoga, mm -hmm. uh, wherein Amrit Kun gets translated into different forms and text and gets seeped into Sufi traditions from Ajmer Sharif to elsewhere. So there is a possibility, therefore, to chart mm -hmm. that process mm -hmm. both through textual as well as actually narrative memory of recent times. Um, and as I'm saying, it's very intriguing to see the presence of uh, some forms of Shaiva practices in Sufi saint shrines in Indian Punjab. Um, and uh, yes, Indian Punjab. And hearth is one of the common place that you would find in many of these shrines. Uh, Trishul will suddenly merge. Mm -hmm. 
with um, what you call um, the Shia symbologies or other um, Sufi symbologies there. So that is an interesting dimension that you see intersecting. In one of the narratives that I can quickly share uh, from the uh, shine near Amritsar actually, known as Khankai Chishtia. Mm. In this particular shine, I detail, detail it in my book also. There is a dream which, where we, in, uh, which is being experienced by a Dalit Christian. Mm. Now, uh, mm. And it's very clearly articulated that he's a Dalit, but he's a Christian. But he's dreaming, he starts getting uh, what you call dream. In his dreams, he starts experiencing the um, uh, visions of um, uh, Sheikh Haider. And then of his being an incarnation of an art saint. You see, so in the dream narratives also, mm. uh, the incarnation of being an art and thereafter he converting to Islam and becoming a, a what you call intermediary and a local saint is very fascinatingly expressed in shrines uh, spaces, very commonly expressed in shrine spaces in Punjab. So it, at least in terms of spaces, in terms of narratives, I can definitely find those instances and examples. But I believe that the Buddhist memory seems to be very far and therefore the direct linkages oh, okay. that may have existed, at least okay. they do not come so clearly in the narratives. Okay. But you're okay. absolutely right hmm. that many, in many of these spaces, uh, you do find uh, uh, closeness of archaeological sites, hmm. particularly yeah. in the historical such spaces, the yeah. presence of the archaeological sites, which may refer to some of the linkages, at least sacred linkages or continuity of the sacred complexes over a longer period of time. Hmm. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jogesh. Uh, so I have three questions here, two from architects. Uh, and uh, um, so I'll and uh, so I'll just tell you their names and I'll read out the questions to you. Uh, the uh, first question is by um, uh, Anisha Shekhar Mukherjee. Uh, let me also tell you that uh, Anisha Shekhar Mukherjee is also curating a very important series of talks on alternative architectures for the IIC. And her question is, uh, thank you for this very interesting talk. My question is related to the architecture of these shrines. How are these shrines added to, maintained, etc.? Is it entirely a local effort? Uh, can you just actually try to, maybe she can explain to me directly. I can't see the question in the chat. Okay, box. I'll, I'll read it out to you again. Uh, let me uh, read out a slightly more detailed one, which she has sent you. She says, uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. My question is related to the architecture of these shrines. Mm -hmm. How are these shrines added to, maintained, etc.? Uh, it is an is it an entirely local effort? Right. Okay. It has been done to. Uh, okay. No. Yeah. That is it. That's what she's saying. Yeah. Obviously, this question is more relevant to maybe the contemporary shrine because historical shrines were endowed by several states, uh, sometimes by princely states in the region, sometimes by Muslim states uh, uh, in the early period. Um, and if you go back to the Tughlaq era, then actually Tughlaq Tughlaqs were the earliest to endow a major spectrum of shrines, Sufi saint shrines in Punjab, uh, from Soravardi to Chishti or otherwise. Mm. But more recent shrines which have come up are very locally endowed. So local businessmen, uh, sometimes jat landowners, sometimes people who have successfully immigrated uh, through apparent grace of uh, uh, the particular shrine or Sufi saint, they while have, being in abroad sent money, sometimes don donate land. So all this is actually emerging not through political patronage. That's an important point to understand. It's very locally available patronages, uh, which lead to the emergence of these shrines. Often a lot of chanda, which offerings which come to the shrine, uh, make it possible. Sometimes actually I have seen, at least in the case of Khanka Chistia, which I already referred to, um, the experiments were also done to for in generating income of the shrine to also breed horses. I came across actually a stud farm inside the sacred Sufi shrine, but then it was later abandoned. Uh, when in my next uh, subsequent visit, I didn't find stud farm any longer. Perhaps it was not a viable. So, but definitely the way shrine spaces have been endowed, the pattern has always been local. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I would say very, very local. Eh? It's not just regional, it's very local. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. So the next question is by Anuj Srivastar, who's also an architect. Uh, what has been done to record oral history, which is such an important aspect of these shrines? Mm -hmm. uh, they may not have much, uh, much architectural value, but have immense historical value. Yeah. Is there any measure to get them listed under a separate category for conservation? 
It's a very tough question. I believe uh, our policymakers are able to do that. Uh, but as a historian, I'm doing my bit. Uh, I spend mm -hmm. almost 10, 15 years uh, just documenting these shrines, uh, which means often I would just land at Pini Shrine, particularly also somewhere, sometimes around the celebration of Urs, Melas, uh, collect their uh, shrine narratives, sometimes orally, sometimes through pamphlets, actually, some posters, huh? sometimes through chapbooks. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of multiple ways in which these shrine narratives uh, remain in circulation, predominantly orally also. And even till today, they are still in the process of getting transformed from oral to any written form. Uh, you don't find much of these narratives in the written form at all. Sometimes you come across newspaper sections, sometimes in fact in the form of CDs. I came across several of these narratives in the form of CDs which are in circulation or also as plays actually. Some were being performed as plays, staged as plays and sometimes as musical performance. In fact, major or majority of them were also being music performed in the form of music cassettes and DVDs and CDs by local art artists produced in small industries around in Pavala or the bigger ones in Jalandhar or otherwise. Huh? So you have these smaller nodes of also musical productions uh, wherein shrine narratives get imagined, retold, uh, recorded, circulated. Uh, in fact, in the form of pictures, hmm? a lot of circulation of photographic images also takes place uh, uh, across these important uh, celebrations of Urs. Huh? So you would see shops selling mementos huh, in the form of uh, smaller pocket uh, photographs or the larger frame photographs of Sufi saints, sometimes their shrines, uh, sometimes about these cross-associational shrines. Actually, one of the important dimension, fascinating aspect that I came across, particularly the photographs around shrine, was how they were trying to build a lineage of shrines, which means how are these different shrines connected with each other? Sometimes a, a, a photographic ensemble would try to put them together. So these set of linkages, these set of perceived and constructed linkages were also expressed in a wide variety of sources which are in circulation. I tried to document it through a Heidelberg Fellowship, but obviously that's a very small number, the thousands of photographs, which may actually at a future stage, I might put up in the form of a, uh, maybe an archival collection, which can be accessible to scholars. Yeah. So, Yogesh, are you really trying to say that conservation is happening, but, you know, we uh, historians tend to, or whatever, architects and historians tend to think of conservation as fixing territorial space, but actually discursively, uh, this is circulating, this uh, uh, knowledge right. is circulating. Right, is it, right. it is in circulation. That's what I'm saying. He, yeah. Historians are not paying attention to it, yeah. but all this material is in circulation. It's right there. We have not paid attention to it. Um, so perhaps historians should uh, move out of the field. Yes. I try to do it a bit by learning from anthropologists and sociologists. Yeah. So yeah. rather than becoming an armchair historian who did my earlier work doing in archives, I went out of the comfort of the archive. <laughs> yes. I moved into fields and it was fascinating actually. I would myself drive sometimes for weeks just documenting one or other shrine, particularly around monsoons because monsoons were at a time when a lot of festivals are held around uh, shrines. So, so I would travel sometime around monsoons and try to document them. So that is the way to do it, actually. The big part of the process that I tried to institute was not to focus, which I've done in this particular talk, where I focus only on one shrine. There was always this historians are always tempted to kind of pick one shrine or one case study to be able to do, and it's a very challenging exercise actually, to be able to, to find it, because otherwise it becomes very distracting. I consciously chose a larger spectrum of shrine, which was a disaster because then you come across such a wide variety of narratives and this impossibility of putting them together. But that was a challenge that I tried to take. And I think in the process, what I learned, that, uh, and therefore I'll argue that shrine is also an individual, uh, uh, what you call autonomous zone of, articulation of religious discourse, articulation of the religious process. And that is what I understood by looking at this wider variety of shrines, but it's out there. It's out there. Yeah. Okay. So we have some, um, uh, some other very interesting questions. So let me just uh, read it to you. There is a further comment by uh, architect Anu Srivastav. I'll, uh, I'll just read it to you, but let me first uh, ask the question by Umakant Mishra. 
And um, uh, this is, let me just, sorry, just, I just can't get the whole text, just a second. Yeah, it says, uh, um, um, just a minute, I seem to have lost the question, just a minute. Somehow I'm not able to see the question. Otherwise yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. It's coming to me. So he says, how do you locate the categories such as, this is Umakant Mishra. Okay. How do you locate the categories such as Hindu, Muslim, Sikh in the background of the nuance shared space that is intertwined and embedded in a deep past? Hmm. That's a tough question. <laughs> and therefore, this is also a historiographic question, not just a question of uh, uh, evaluation. And one of the ways to understand it too is actually to look at uh, how the contemporary census works. Mm, maybe that is the way I can try to respond to it. Now, recently what happened, now this is not in the context of this particular shrine that I'm talking about, an important Valmiki Tirth shrine emerged in uh, near Amritsar. Now, um, the shrine was recently renamed as Valmiki, otherwise earlier it was known as Ram Tirth. So from Ram Tirth it has become Valmiki Tirth now. Now, the politics behind and the process behind this shrine is very interesting. Now, you would recall that um, recently the uh, Shromani Gurdwara Pramatra Committee uh, through uh, the central government brought in, um, at a, actually Akali Dal along with the central government brought in an amendment to the Sikh Gurdwara Act, um, removing the Sahedari Sikhs from uh, the qualification of voters. Uh, in the, the Sikh Gurdwara Act. So me, which means within uh, the Sikh Gurdwara Act, now Sajdaris, inclusive of a large spectrum of communities which are classified as Majavis, uh, who are Valmiki uh, um, Sikhs, if I may classify them as, have been removed as voters to the uh, Gurdwara um, elections. Now, what has happened in this Valmiki, it's interestingly, this is a shine instituted by the Akhali Dal itself. I was looking at the act, um, uh, the Valmiki Tirath Act, huh? and among the board members which are, uh, which have been nominated into the board, you, you know, other than the ex officio member, which are the DC and otherwise, you have member of the Valmiki community who will be the part of the board and the Mazabi, uh, from the Mazabi community, very clearly written, the Valmikis and the Mazabis who would be part and parcel of the management of the Ram Tirth, uh, the Valmiki Tirth, because it called it Ram Ram Tirth now. Now, I try to see this as a process also through the lens of the census. So what is happening actually here is that in the post-1947 era, we have conveniently shifted to a census where other than Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Sikh, Buddhists, other nomenclatures have ceased to, ceased to exist. Now, we can look at it at, through pros and cons of the entire uh, uh, census process. But what it has done, eh, let me give you one example of it, is that communities who were claiming themselves to be not Hindus, very clearly not Hindus in the colonial context, example of these would be Adharmis, eh, uh, who were actually registered as separate communities, remember, in the colonial census. Post-colonial census calls themselves, calls them, uh, classifies them as Hindus. There's no other way actually they can classify themselves. So within the architecture of the state system there today, today Valmikis of Punjab call themselves are not Hindus. They call themselves the Valmikis. So Valmiki is a separate religion actually. Uh, unlike the way sometimes scholars look at Valmiki as a category within Hinduism, no. They consider there are movements in Punjab which classify Valmiki as Bhagwan, classify Valmiki um, tradition as separate religion. So you have Valmikis, you have Adharmis earlier now who are known as Ravidasiyas who also call themselves a separate religion. They have separate religious texts, sacred texts. They are not Hindus. So irrespective of that fact, when a colonial census officer will come to them, he would obviously ask them, what religion do you belong to from the given nomenclature of their uh, census tradition? So I think that is the problem. Uh, and un and uh, and, and I'm trying to explain it. That's also not just a census problem. It's also a historiographic problem, therefore. So when you approach uh, these shrines, I have been very conscious of not making use of my own uh, uh, pejorative way of looking at religious traditions or sects. I would rather would want to pay attention to how do uh, my interviewees or my case studies, they speak of 
um, uh, the religious process. What do they call them? And therefore, this nomenclature of Dalit Christian uh, and uh, 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 what you call um, uh, uh, worshipper of a Sufi said is does not go in con is go in contradistinction. It's a completely acceptable form of religious expression. So you would want to inscribe that you are Christian because you were born in a Dalit, uh, Christian family. So you would try to retain the Dalit identity, but also Christian identity because your parents were Christians. Huh? But you would also want to assume a newer kind of identity, but not doing away with the older, remember? Uh, and also convert later to Islam and assume a new character. But all these antecedents would also continue to carry over. What I'm trying to say here is that the way historians try to look at it, where the way scholars try to look at it, perhaps they are more keen and interested in inscribing the dominant identity, placing the dominant identity, but in religious expression, that is not the way it is usually expressed. Uh, very far less than in the rural communities, perhaps far more in the urban communities. Uh, 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 urban communities, I'm saying, uh, because of the particular religious process which has undertaken in the late 19th, early 20th, 20th century, urban places definitely are far more articulate about their dominant religious identity as compared to rural communities. Though I'm saying it, stating it still with a sense of bias because when I say urban, I'm particularly referring to larger urban spaces, uh, not the smaller urban spaces, which are close to rural areas, once again, Mundis and other smaller towns. I hope I was able to answer. I don't even now remember what was the okay. question. <laughs> yeah, but thank you, Yogesh. Uh, many more questions coming up. So uh, let me uh, quickly uh, read out to you. Uh, so here is a uh, just a comment, I think a response. Uh, Anush Srivastava who had already asked you a question. He said, I comment you on your effort, Professor. More power to your effort. I was in the army and posted to a remote area which had a shrine next to my post near Baramulla among several others. I completely understand and support your work. Uh, um, uh, now, uh, Katie Ravindran uh, has a kind of comment and a question. Um, uh, uh, I think the fluidity of tradition belief systems are linked to the non-canonized narratives. How does one protect this fluidity? I think it follows from what you were saying last time. Hmm. Quick, a quick answer. And then there are a couple of other questions. Right. I want. My quick answer would be that uh, the problem is actually with the historical narratives, the way we try to present it, because we put and fix, uh, 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 inscribe a fixity to the narratives. I, I, as a historian, have tried to look at religions, and I actually make use of B. D. Chattopadhyay's uh, reading also in some of these processes, though he looks at political processes, of in the process. I, I think most religious traditions are always in the process. And the fact that the Gorakhmat today is a site of uh, Sanatan religiosity, expands that process and, uh, away from its Nath antecedents. So, which means that you need to pay attention to the changing forms of the religious processes mm -hmm. rather than inscribing one as the real and the other as uh, uh, what you call aberration to the process. So, sometimes historians, I've tried to come across some of the friends also uh, who would try to say, not uh, traditional Gorakh Panth has changed. Original Naths were not like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you are inscribing in the originality of the Nath, then actually you are losing attention to the religious process. Mm -hmm. I think the historian's task is to look at the religious process. And one of my students got very irritated in one of my class uh, because he was upset about the Marwadi uh, patronage to the uh, Tamil Jaina sites in Chennai. Uh, so he he tried to present it as a political problem, wherein the Marwadis who are outsiders are trying to now patronize and therefore take over the Tamil Jaina shrines. I said, no, you as a historian shouldn't be doing like that. You should be paying attention to questions about why is it happening? The question of why it is happening and religious really change is a dynamic change. Uh, I, 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 therefore I'm saying it's a process. And if historians don't put and pay attention to the process through which this is happening, uh, which may not be a what you call hegemonic process, some of these are dynamic processes actually. Mm. So we lose the sight of dynamic process because we are so consumed, overwhelmed by uh, uh, what you call uh, the, uh, uh, the dominant narrative context. So dynamism, we get lo lose the sight of dynamism in that process. I have tried to be short, but 
That's so, our... I think you put it very well. I think we have to, uh, you know, instead of using the term hegemony, we have to use dynamism, you know, yes. not hegemonic, but dynamism. Yes. yes. Uh, so here is a provocative question from Mohini uh, Malik. Uh, it actually follows from what you were saying just now. I was interested by your conscious avoidance of the term Hindu, quote unquote Hindu. Right. Would you say more on this? See, my avoidance of the term Hindu is precisely because uh, even um, a Hindu in any urban context, while my pub, while publicly may call himself a Hindu politically, but actually, if you look at in terms of practice, he may call himself closely to be a Sanatani rather than a Hindu, an Aresamaji rather than a Hindu. So expressions of religiosity, if you're looking at religious process and not political identities, uh, and I, I mean, this public-private distinction is also very interesting because even state inscribes that. So you would want to place yourself as Hindu when you would ask, who are you? Uh, now, given a chance, if anyone, there was a possibility in the census to state you're a Sanatani or an Ayar Samaji, I'm pretty sure that person would have called himself to be a Sanatani. So I'm saying, and therefore, as I'm uh, continuously emphasizing on spaces, uh, both private uh, and religious spaces, these articulation of, uh, and I've come across within Sufi shrines also. Now, someone would be a Hindu, but at the same time, a follower of a Sufi saint shrine, and therefore would assume a newer identity and call himself as Sabariya. So a new set of surname is in circulation in Punjab among the, uh, the Sabariyas of Punjab, who prefer themselves to be called as Sabariyas, irrespective of the fact that they may have been born a Valmiki or a, a Punjabi Hindu or urban Khatri or otherwise. They prefer to call themselves a sabri and never comfortable form of religious expression that they are. So Hindu can be a sabri also, therefore, in that process. So all I'm trying to say here is that where do you place this set of religious expressions is an important question. When you're talking about the religious process, I would say religious process is not so simpler in terms of expressions. It is overlapping. Yes, when you're talking about uh, a more public space, when you're talking about uh, expression of your identity in a political process, then perhaps it follows on in more hegemonic mode. But that doesn't explain the process. Therefore, I avoid it. So, Jogesh, now we are uh, nearing our curfew time, but uh, there are still a couple of questions. So, um, let me just quickly uh, read this to you. This is from Asha uh, Gopinathan. Uh, what is the link between these shrines and deras like the dera Sacha Soda? very much in the news. Uh, do they have also a large following, political clout? Quickly, <laughs> then I'll ask you the next question. Yeah. Political clout question has recently been very interesting, responded by Paramjit Jaj, which Professor Datta was also referring to, a very interesting article that he has written about the myth of the Dera political clout. So I would not try to respond to that question here. But uh, uh, the links between shrines and deras um, is an interesting question. Uh, I place Sufi shrines in the larger uh, practice of deras. Uh, and you know, by dera, I don't refer to it as in the pejorative sense. I would refer to dera uh, as, a, as dynamic. In fact, if you look at the etymology of the term dera, dera means a place of temporary uh, settlement, you see. So uh, in the process is therefore inbuilt into the idea of Dera. And these are fascinating spaces because they may be problematic huh? uh, and therefore Sacha Shoda has always been problematic in the process huh? because of the money, wealth, they accumulate in the process sometimes. But not all Deras are wealthy. You know? There you have smaller Deras. You see what happens that because of one or other Dera, you try to politically also marginalize the dynamic presence of deras in the landscape of Punjab. And uh, I look at it as in terms of more dynamism because as I said, in the, while paying attention to the religious process, they are in the making, they're changing, they're constantly transforming. And unlike our dominant religious traditions, uh, the way, way we try to understand Hinduism or Islam or uh, Sikhism of today, deras actually present a religious milieu which is very fluid. Uh, which is very dynamic, which is very attuned to change. And therefore, I think they are uh, uh, more fascinating spaces to understand the religious process. But uh, yes, Dera form uh, shrines uh, can be situated in the larger process of uh, the Dera uh, culture, but I would not like to use it in pejorative sense, definitely. And therefore, Sacha Soda Association is the bad example, bad association that you would want to make. 
such a soda is notorious definitely but um, you have a large number of other data uh, uh, and when you look at it they are the ones and i sometimes give examples of this also where is it that critique of alcoholism coming from where is there the critique of dowry coming from where is the critique of drug abuse coming from none of it is coming from hindu temples or sikh gurdwaras or they are coming from deras you see a uh, marriage with one single rupee is actually the practice of uh, radha swamis deras huh? so they condemn dowry you know they said okay you marry with one rupee so if you look at therefore deras in the larger spheres of their practice they are the one which are ripe with social critique they are one which are ripe with creative energies and synergies but obviously there are also places where wealth is accumulating where all kinds of other things are all happening and these are part and parcel of the larger problem and not necessarily the problem of the term dera or the idea of dera uh, because most religions over a period of time be assumed dominance and that's what also happens to sikhism you see a critique of caste within sikhism has been an important process but that's not what sikhism is of today is this today sikhism is to today is as much a religion of dominance and therefore marginalization of the lower classes among and castes among the sikhs uh, who don't find presence in sikhism therefore uh, linger on to deras therefore linger on to private gurdwaras actually many of the affluent among the dalit sikhs have started constructing their own gurdwaras so i'm saying ki uh, picking one example and then pitting them with might not be a better example i think attention should be paid to larger process yeah i i'll uh, i think we are just it's almost going to be 6:30 so we'll have to wind up uh, but i just want to read this uh, uh, comment which has come uh, uh, yogesh which says it's not a question it's a comment so i'll just want to read it out to you. Thank you. Thank from you. tata hasneen uh, very interesting talk in kashmir valley also various local peers uh, uh, that is peer shri- shrines try to keep up and continue the sacredness of certain spaces as opposed to the sufi orders mm. that come from iran or iraq in earlier centuries and built new and well endowed structures like the famous shai hamadan or dastgir sahab the mm. former in kashmir called themselves rishis or rishis mm. though almost all of them are muslims mm. that's a very interesting uh, you know so clearly uh, uh, tata hosen is trying to make a distinction between these two kinds of traditions uh, popular traditions that are there yeah. um uh, thank you professor uh, snehi for this uh, wonderful talk and we have had such interesting discussion and it's also opened windows in the mind one makes to think about make connections all kinds of connections and there's such a rich history and as i said right in the beginning that it really makes us think about the punjab landscape in completely different ways um so uh, thank you very much uh, thank you professor himanshu prabha re for organizing this wonderful series and thank you to iic and to uh, to tete and sandeep biswas and the team in the office who have had to put this together and um, uh, and thank you for all the participants for uh, for joining in and for uh, for sending in the questions thank It's you it's been a pleasure thank you very much thank yeah. you yeah yeah bye